So welcome again at day two of Infrachain Summit. It's a pleasure really to have you there. And um, we had already an exciting day yesterday with our Minister of Economy, Franz Bayo, who was underlining the importance of blockchain also for the Latin economy. We had great insights from our host here, PWC. They explained to us that by 2030, we expect some 40 million jobs being created through blockchain. And also they were telling us five killer or key applications that you can see in blockchain, which is about traceability, identity, it's also about uh, procurement, about contract management, and about customer engagement. And I think some of these topics we will also see them in the different presentations throughout uh, the day today. We also had the cylinders actually underlined the reliability of oracles, uh, very important indeed in, in blockchain, and we had winding tree explaining us how to cut out intermediaries and last but not least technoport who gave us some good explanation about uh, blockchain best practices in sm for smes and they presented their handbook that you can download on the peers blockchain website so my name is uh, tom kettles i'm the project leader of infrachain and i will be your master of ceremonies for today and also for tomorrow the third day of infrachain summit and also, and also today, today we, we have, have, of course, a great, great program for you. We have two main topics, topics today. today. It's blockchain governance and the second one, blockchain in finance. We'll start with the keynote presented, presented by Consensus. Guillaume Deschaux from, from, from Consensus will shortly after myself uh, present this keynote. keynote. And then we'll have a presentation from Bill Laboon of the Web3 Foundation. We will have Nomadic Labs. And with Nomadic Labs, we will transition into finance uh, with Scorchain. Centrifuge and, and uh, uh, Block Gemini before then the wrap up of today again with PwC. So don't leave after the last meeting because we'll have to wrap up and we will also have the QA session. So you can ask your questions at the end of the conference um, when we will do uh, the wrap up. A big, A big thank, thank you to all our sponsors, sponsors of this event. event. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, PwC, they are gold sponsor, and we're in the Beautiful, beautiful studio uh, today, today, so we're very, very happy to be here for, for this presentation and to welcome you virtually in this setting. And we also thank, of course, our silver sponsors, Net Service, Tillimbus, and uh, Tomorrow Street. Now, now the blockchain today in 2020, 2020 is gone, and the technology has now become mainstream and is used really for real benefits. benefits. And the first Consortia, they were funded based on the promise that the technology would solve really all the pain points, all the problems of some industry, like for instance in trade finance. And we see that actually only a few consortia, they were really successful and they really made a difference. And these were the right actually with the governance. Governance in blockchain is definitely key. Governance of the blockchain consortia is a key criteria for success. And today's keynote speaker is Guillaume de Chaux, as already told you, he's the global co-head of sales at Consensus, and he will share his expertise on blockchain governance with us. Blockchain has actually over 20 years of experience in capital market, in training, structuring, and financing at Société Générale, Barclays, BNP Paribas, and HSBC, where we held several management positions. And then later in 2016, you co-founded a company called the Trade Quorum, a blockchain, blockchain startup uh, involved in digitizing processes in energy post trade services and energy trade finance. And Trade Quorum joined consensus in June 2018. You a Bachelor of Arts in Mathematics and an MBA in Finance. And he joined us today from Paris, I believe. So, you, please, the camera is yours. So good afternoon, all of you. Um, I hope you're all well and safe. Many thanks uh, to the InfraChain team and Tom to make this event uh, possible despite the current con condition. Uh, it's great to be all together. So as uh, Tom said, I'm Guillaume Deschaux. I'm the uh, global head of uh, business development at Consensus. Um, and I've been in the business for quite a while now. So just for those who don't know uh, Consensus, uh, we are the worldwide blockchain leading company on Ethereum. 
with offices in certain countries. We are selling infrastructure products to the main Fortune 500 companies, but also to fintech startups and um, any types of organization. We're quite involved in DeFi as well. Uh, you may have heard that we've developed uh, a lot of a few consortium on our side, Covantis, Congo, um, Liquid Share, and a few others. Uh, those projects are now in production. We're also very active in the CDBC area and developing currently seven projects with central banks. But it's not about consensus today, so let me talk about, uh, give you a bit of context about uh, this, uh, this keynote today. Um, since 2017, um, a lot of uh, large corporates have joined forces to create blockchain consortium either on Ethereum, Corda, or Fabric, the three main technologies. Uh, in 2017-18, um, it was the beginning of the blockchain hype. As you know, a lot of corporates had done uh, some proof of concept, and it was time to go to production. This is why they all joined forces together uh, to create some, uh, some consortium. Um, at the time, as Tom was saying, the blockchain was a promise that the technology will solve all the pain points of uh, all the industries, in particular in trade finance, commodities, pharma, insurance, um, while preserving, uh, the, preserving the integrity of some, the data of the participants. So um, two years later, um, not all uh, consortium are successful. Some didn't even manage to go to production. Some others didn't have the right business models or uh, some others finally didn't manage to, uh, to create adoption. So uh, all large companies have spent millions. Oh, what a piece of work is the man. Sorry? No, oh, maybe it's uh, someone that has a micro open. So, um, yeah, all the core large companies have spent millions in some consortium, but uh, only a few of them will survive. And uh, it expected that we'll see uh, a lot of uh, m a activities in the coming months, probably in trade finance and uh, other area where we'll see a lot of costs of merging or uh, stopping. And uh, we can ask ourselves today, why is uh, the reason why for source cost to, uh, to fail? And uh, that's the topic of today. The main reason is uh, the governance. So I will hide a few uh, elements key elements of, uh, of governance that, which are uh, critical. First of all, there are uh, three main uh, to uh, discussion topics in, when we talk about governance for those consortium. First one, and probably the most important at the really beginning is the strategic and business governance. So this topic has to be addressed before any development of the platform. It's about alignment between the main shoulders of the consortia. Uh, it's about legal structure of the project, business plan, etc. We're going to see that in a few minutes. The second one is about the operational governance. Uh, once the team has been uh, formed, uh, it's about putting in place the right processes in place for a successful delivery. Um, uh, as we said, there are a lot of uh, consortium um, which didn't go even to production. Uh, so the operational governance is uh, critical. And finally, the last uh, topic in terms of governance is the network governance, or basically the technical governance is how you define uh, the, uh, uh, this network. So if you look at, you, at all those consortium, you need to make a difference between the network itself and the application. And here the, uh, the network uh, defined the, the rules to access the network, who's gonna be uh, uh, voting on that network, uh, who get uh, access to that network. So let's go uh, straight to uh, the strategic and business governance. Main topic is um, the business model. Um, well, if you look at all these uh, four uh, blue boxes, um, they probably apply to any blockchain uh, uh, company, actually it can be a startup or um, uh, a consortium, but you would be very surprised to hear that most companies uh, in the blockchain industry would not qualify if they had to go through all uh, these uh, criteria. So first of all, the business model. It sounds probably obvious to you that um, the platform, their platform have been built without the uh, uh, real um, 
uh, real and uh, uh, market addressable market confirmed by users. But yes, it's uh, it's uh, it's true. There are. Um, uh, Yes, there are, there are probably a workshop with users to define the uh, uh, the market, but uh, a lot of them didn't have addressable market. So would you uh, do, um, I don't know, a platform, for example, uh, in Europe for private shares? Uh, probably not. Do Would you do it in the US? Yes. And a lot of uh, um, uh, concerns have been launched without really real business model. Um, Second thing is strong value uh, for the for the uh, creation for all the industry actors. So we need to understand why the actors are joining those uh, those consortium. Some of them are looking to uh, reduce their costs, some others to gain market shares, and the shareholders of those consortium they're looking to uh, to monetize at some point the value of their network. A lot of uh, consortium have been uh, trying to go everywhere. Uh, so they've been trying to uh, go to several markets at the same time to a lot of the varieties of, of customers. So it's important to be super focused uh, on the on market and customers. Uh, another question which comes uh, at the other first governance is a platform utility or is it for profit? Um, or is it a hybrid? So you could do, for instance, a network, which is a utility, but develop some application which are for profit. Governance about funding. Um, assuming that it requires between six to 12 months or normally, but sometimes uh, more, more than that, for to develop a minimum viable product, MVP. Um, and knowing that to make a second round of funding, it takes between six to eight months. It's vital to get minimum funding for at least 18 months uh, when we launch a consortium. And some of them have stopped just because of lack of funding. If we look at the platform structure and, uh, and design, so the legal structure of the consortium is key. It's uh, uh, you, you need to decide from the beginning whether it's gonna be just a, a project handled by the shoulders or is there is a dedicated company separate from the shoulders, which is uh, set up. The, uh, in terms of a um, lot of uh, consortium which have been built, in particular in trade finance, have, been, have tried to replicate the workflows and uh, of the traditional uh, industry. The same in commodities and some other area where a digital platform is very different from that. It's about reinventing those workflows and potentially disrupting uh, some uh, participants which are currently existing in the uh, outside the digital world. And finally, when we talk about the platform design, um, let's not forget that a, a platform is made for the users. Uh, users don't really care about the blockchain. They want uh, a nice user experience and the most important is to do a platform for the users because ultimately they're going to be the one using it. Finally, in the strategic uh, and business governance, the tech choice. Um, so uh, the first question which comes to, uh, uh, to, to my mind is always to ask ourselves, do we really need a blockchain? I think if we look at all some consortium today, uh, people probably realized that uh, maybe blockchain was not really, really, really necessary and you can uh, work with competitors uh, as uh, together, as, uh, even though you're competitors, you can preserve your integrity, integrity of your data without a real blockchain. So blockchain is a great technology, uh, but it needs to be used for what it is. Uh, 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 so first question is always ask, do we really need a, a blockchain? Vendor selection, um, too many uh, consortium have launched themselves without real proper RFP and the proper uh, selection of the vendor. IP management is a key, uh, crit uh, is a key um, discussion. So, uh, but that we need to ask ourselves, is the IP owned by the company uh, which is created? Is it owned by a by the, um, by the shoulders, by the original shoulders, what about the new shoulders coming? IP is always uh, a critical discussion between the older shoulders. Um, we can take choices as well. We can discuss about uh, 
the uh, infrastructure cost. Um, we need to be able to, uh, to, to build some consortia uh, where, where the, uh, the infrastructure cost, what we, we call it usually the running cost, is accessible. Um, we know that the adoption is, uh, is slow on those consortium and this infrastructure cost is too high and there's, uh, there's uh, no way to, uh, to scale at, um, at, uh, to the next level. And finally, uh, in this strategic and business governance, it's key to have uh, uh, to think about the integration with legacy systems. In particular, when we do uh, platform for banks, um, the first MVP need to limit itself to very little integration with uh, legacy systems. Otherwise, the adoption will be very minimal. So the two other topics I mentioned was the operational and the network uh, governance. Just looking at the time. Uh, first of all, the operational governance. So I, I mentioned that the legal structure of the, those consortium is important. It's key uh, to have uh, to to create a new company uh, separated from from the shareholders. Um, we know that uh, the shareholders don't have necessarily all the same uh, interest. So this new code will have freedom to maneuver uh, operationally and will make uh, some decision choices, which will probably not suit uh, every single uh, shareholders. In terms of, um, uh, I'm not going to go through all the, the those points. Uh, it's, it's important uh, to talk about the data standards and format as well. Um, those consortium. Uh, so, uh, as you, you've seen in the in the previous uh, in the previous pages, that uh, uh, some consortium have uh, the same uh, topic. Might be trade finance. Might be might be committee trade finance. They're all are looking after the uh, the same um, the uh, the same segment of uh, of the business, and it's important to choose the right data standards because ultimately there will be there will be uh, interoperability between all of them. Uh, so I just heard, that, for instance, uh, uh, recently that there was a new. Um, uh, consortium in Europe uh, in the automotive sector, uh, which is going to use a very different uh, data standards from the uh, from the one defined by the, the consortium uh, Mobi in the US, and uh, it's not a good sign because those two uh, networks will never be able to uh, interoperate uh, fully. If we talk about the network governance, I touched a bit uh, before, um, it, it's very important to. Uh, to define what, what the rules of that network. Uh, that's why we talk about the network topology. Who is a validator, in a, a validator or not? Is it uh, only the shareholders or is it anyone who buys a node on, the, on, the, on that network? Um, uh, are the nodes multi-tenant, meaning that uh, uh, can, can, can you have a, a, an entity on a node which is not a validating node? Um, so, that defined what we call the, the network uh, topology, and uh, it will define as well the consensus mechanism and who has access uh, to uh, to the network, the permissions, and the identities of uh, on that network. I just want to recap a bit uh, about the accountabilities and authorities of the project teams to make it successful. And there are mainly four of them when we build teams for on that project. The first one is a legal responsibility. Um, those platforms have uh, terms and conditions and uh, usually take uh, uh, quite a while before uh, uh, to draft them. Um, the, those platforms, because they represent uh, 70 or 80 percent of an industry have to go through all the legal and regulatory requirements, all the uh, uh, the pain of going through uh, all the antitrust regulators around the world. It usually takes uh, between six to eight months. It's quite uh, it's quite an impressive work uh, to do. So the second thing is architecture architecture choices. Um, we need to define uh, from the beginning what is a, the deployment uh, methodology. Is it on-premise? Is it uh, um, on on-premise um, on or uh, on fully managed uh, uh, service? Um, and uh, 
So I got lost. Yes, and uh, uh, make some difficult uh, decision around the uh, <laughs> And uh, uh, so, so the thing is that someone can Thank you. All right. So third thing is delivery of the of the product. The delivery teams are a key in those uh, in those projects. Um, they are, they need to find. Maybe the host can mute uh, someone. All right. Um, so the delivery of the product is uh, is key, and uh, and finally the business model and commercial traction that what we discussed before. It's uh, it's key to uh, to make a proper adoption uh, of the platform. Um, just to find to finish, I wanted to make a, a a quick recap of the best organizations that we've seen uh, among consortium. Uh, Obviously, you have the execution team that are responsible for the delivery of the uh, MVP and achieving KPIs. And uh, just for that, you have the project leadership. Uh, they are uh, part of the execution team, but they are responsible for scoping the MVP and the delivery of uh, that MVP. Um, and uh, most importantly, uh, you have a board, usually they are the shareholders. They set the strategy and the vote, um, uh, the strategic direction of the project. They validate the high level business case and requirements and um, respond usually to critical issues raised by the project leadership and teams. So, done with this, uh, uh, thank you very much much for your attention and if you have any question please uh, let me know thank you thank you guillaume thank you very much for this uh, great insight so so i think we had a lot of interesting stuff here sorry i have an echo now myself so i have to take this off okay so now it's good it's better um, yeah, so I think you will ask a very interesting question, a very fundamental question, of course, do we really need a blockchain? And that is something that everybody that wants to address such a, a project has to first ask. Uh, and that is really a crucial um, question. You also underlined uh, the customer centric aspect. So never forget the customer, never lose the customer out of sight. Before moving on to the next speaker now, let me first inform you about our big contest. You have read about it probably on the website. We have organized a contest. We organize a contest with Infrachain Summit and you have the opportunity to actually win this great uh, Sonos uh, quality uh, speaker. And it's quite simple. Each day of Infrachain Summit, we have two questions. They are on the website infrachainsummit.com slash quiz. So you can go to the website and reply to the questions and then tomorrow we'll have a lucky winner and the lucky winner will be the one who actually first replied correctly to all the six questions that will be asked. So good luck to you. And uh, one important thing, uh, if you participate, the email that you use to participate must absolutely be the same than the one you used to register for the conference since the quiz is only open to conference participants. So good luck. And uh, so before moving on also to the next speaker, let me thank once again our sponsors, PwC Gold Sponsors and uh, Net Service, uh, Till and Dus and Tomorrow Street as Silver Sponsors. And we will see some, some short messages from them now. Etherna, blockchain made simple. Etherna offers an easy way to integrate blockchains with any customer applications. Etherna guarantees full application compatibility and interoperability with the client's existing IT system. Etherna ensures faster transactions, reduced costs and greater compliance with GDPR directives. In addition to API interfacing services, Etherna offers products designed to Provide a registration certificate on the blockchain for all file types. Be cert. Perform secure online voting via blockchain. Be voting. Certify a supply chain or a production process on blockchain. 
be supply sign certified documents on blockchain be signature etherna blockchain made simple www.etherna.com Okay, we're back in the studio and we come to the next speaker and it's again about blockchain governance and it's uh, Bill Laboon, the technical education lead at the Web3 Foundation. And uh, so before actually being at the Web3 Foundation, Bill, he was a lecturer in the computer science department of the University of Pitzing, Pittsburgh, teaching courses in software quality assurance, software engineering and uh, blockchain technology. And actually, Bill, he is also an author. He did not only write a textbook, but also a near future novel, which is set actually in a world where uh, cryptocurrency has eliminated the traditional money. The book is called Strength in Number, and I can really and, and I can really recommend the read. It's quite enjoyable, and I hope that uh, well, when people can meet again, that sometime. Bill, I have the opportunity to have a coffee with you and you have to tell me a bit more about the role of Vera in the book. So that was a bit intriguing to me, actually. And uh, yes, so Bill he's a, has a Bachelor of science, uh, of science in Computer Science and Political Science from the University of Pittsburgh, as well as a Master of Science in Software Design and Management from Carnegie Mellon University. And uh, Bill will talk about Polka.com governments governance for those not familiar with polka dot it is a heterogeneous multi-chain system which has an extremely flexible on chain governance system and i think bill you join from switzerland anyway the mic is yours the camera is yours all right uh thank you tom uh it is an honor uh to be here please give me a moment to uh to share my screen Hopefully everyone uh, can see that. Please feel free to yell at me in chat if you don't. Uh, so yeah, so uh, thank you uh, once again. I'm going to uh, discuss the specifics of how governance works on the Polkadot system. So uh, I realize that saying that Polkadot is a heterogeneous multi-chain is kind of uh, confusing uh, for, for some people. So the idea though is simply that no single blockchain is going to meet the needs of everybody. Uh, there are some people uh, that are going to need blockchains that uh, have uh, extra privacy built into them. And there are some who are going to want to have you know, very simple blockchains like for payment mechanisms only. There are others who are going to want to have full smart contract mechanisms or specific um, uh, features that are useful for gaming or insurance or whatever. So the idea behind Polkadot is that it is heterogeneous. We provide a framework where individuals and teams can create their own blockchains as well as run applications on top of them. And all of these blockchains that can be created can also join uh, the, the, what we call a relay chain. Uh, this is similar in concept to the beacon chain in ETH2. It's a single chain that all of these other chains can connect to and interact with each other as well as share security. And as, as we do this, there needs to be some evolution of the chain, of this, this relay chain. So Polkadot governance doesn't impact these individual extra blockchains. Uh, as long as those blockchains are truthfully saying what they are doing and when they're joining, they tell us the rules of how they are going to operate and how they are going to evolve, they can use whatever uh, governance system they like. So this is for the, the, the central relay chain. And that relay chain is going to have to evolve. We add additional features, we figure out what works and what doesn't. And the people that should decide this in our philosophical opinion are the stakeholders, the people who own the dot, the people who uh, own the network. And so uh, Polkadot has some goals for what kind of governance system 
could be created for this. So we saw you know, empirically what's happening with you know, some other networks that don't have on-chain governance. Uh, we saw problems with them. We, you know, we see forks, we see arguments, we see that the developers have a lot of control over the direction of the network. And so when we were trying to decide uh, what kind of governance system we wanted, we had some goals. First, we wanted to make good decisions uh, for some definition of good, especially even with low voter turnout. Uh, this is a real problem with blockchain governance. You often see voter turnout in the low single digits, uh, you know, one or two percent. Uh, so, you know, we, we have, you know, there, there are issues whenever you have such a small percentage uh, of voting, such a small turnout uh, on making good decisions. Uh, we wanted to keep the community united and avoid forks. We wanted to make sure that there were no unintended consequences uh, to voting. We wanted to make sure it was scalable so that many participants could consider many proposals and that this would not be something that any time there was, was a change, it would take a year or two to go through. Uh, and finally, we wanted to preserve the decentralized qualities uh, of the network. So there is no single account that from the beginning of the network has privilege over another. So there are no special super user accounts. Uh, when we actually, when we first launched the network uh, for a few months, just to uh, make sure that everything was going well, we actually did have a super user uh, account and we uh, uh, shut that off uh, ourselves. The super user actually uh, uh, shut itself off uh, back in uh, June, excuse me, July. Uh, so the, the key goal here is we wanted to make sure all changes to the protocol are agreed upon by stake-weighted referendum. What we mean by that is the majority of stake, if 50% of all the DOT holders, DOT is the native token of Polkadot, 50% plus one agree that the network should go in a particular direction, that is the way the network should go. So how we did this is we provided the ability to create proposals. And these proposals uh, are just some yes, no, binary option to change the network parameters in some way. And this, these network parameters can be very small. You can make a, uh, you could propose a slight change, for instance, in how many people sit on the council or what, uh, how many validators we should have, you know, a very small change, all the way up to changing the entire runtime of the system and, and vote. So we can change the rules of the system uh, itself. So any individual can create by, you know, they, they make a bond uh, to make sure, you know, to avoid spam proposals. They have a bond uh, that they have to post. And this goes into the proposal queue, this proposal. And remember, this is just a yes, no proposal, you know, change or, or don't change. There's no gradations or anything like that. We try to keep it simple to avoid uh, side effects and complexities. So others can also post a bond other accounts to second these proposals. And every 28 days, uh, as a new voting period comes up, the most seconded proposal becomes a referendum. And then there is 28 days for users to vote on it. And there are some wrinkles to this voting I'll, I'll discuss and what exactly it means uh, for this to pass. Uh, but if this referendum passes, the proposal inside of it automatically executes. It's not a message uh, to, the, to the developers to do something. It actually changes the runtime itself by executing. It's sort of a, you know, a self-executing uh, proposal. You can think of it almost like a smart contract is a self-executing contract. If the users decide this is what we wanna do, this is actually what will happen. So I mentioned there are a few wrinkles uh, to this. One is the council. So there are a certain number of members who join the, the, the Polkadot council. Uh, all DOT holders can vote on these via rotating approval vote. That is, you submit your candidacy uh, and uh, you as a voter can uh, you know, do an approval vote. I, yes, I, I like this candidate. No, I don't like this candidate. Yes, I like this candidate. And they are uh, rotated onto uh, the council. And uh, this council uh, has some very specific powers. The main goal of the council is to represent those passive stakeholders indirectly. 
the, remember I said usually only about one or two percent of stakeholders on any network, really not just Polkadot, uh, turn out uh, for votes. So the Polkadot Council represents that other 98 or 99 uh, percent by getting certain extra powers. Uh, first, they can issue referenda, which are easier to pass. Uh, and we'll talk about what that means momentarily. They control the treasury so they can provide some funding. And along with the technical committee, another group I'll mention in a moment, they can issue emergency referenda, which are just uh, faster to pass referenda. Uh, so these powers are very limited. They can be over, and they can be overruled by, by stakeholders. So uh, you, know, you notice you know, two of their powers are just issuing refer slightly different referenda. But 50% plus one of the stake can always overrule these. The treasury is probably the most powerful aspect of, of uh, the, the Polkadot Council. So Polkadot has an on-chain treasury and it obtains funds as a percentage of transaction fees and some other uh, things that happen on the systems, fun some funds automatically go to the treasury. And then the council has ways of redistributing that uh, that uh, the value in the treasury uh, to in various ways. So there are three main ways. First, uh, you can anyone can propose a tip. That is, they've seen someone do real, something really cool for Polkadot, and they think that there should be a tip. They can submit to the council, "Hey, I think this person uh, deserves you know a small amount of dot as a uh, a, uh, a thank you for doing this." Uh, so those are tips. Uh, an individual, can, if they want a little bit more, uh, can actually do a proposal. Hey, I want to do this for Polkadot. The treasury can, uh, should give me uh, so many dots so that I can fund it. And the council will vote on this. And finally, bounties. So the council can say, this is something we specifically want. Uh, and then they can have uh, stakeholders vote on who would be one to show that this uh, uh, thing that we want has actually been met and to judge them and people can try to meet that bounty and the curator, the person who was elected to uh, verify that they actually uh, met uh, what the bounty asked for, can then uh, pay out uh, uh, from the treasury uh, on behalf of those, uh, those uh, on behalf of, of the, the council. So uh, two things I wanted to mention about uh, the vote. Uh, so remember I said there are a few wrinkles. When you vote in Polkadot, there's something called adaptive quorum biasing. And the idea here is we don't want a very small percentage uh, of, of the uh, DOT stakeholders to be able to pass something uh, just because there's very low turnout. So for instance, imagine uh, you've got 0.75% of the uh, of DOT stakeholders uh, of voting. And 0.6% of all DOT holders vote to, uh, you know, I don't know, give an individual uh, you know, a million DOTs or something, you know, give them all the DOTs from the treasury. Well, that's, that's really a bad idea just because uh, you know, some small percentage uh, you know, wanted something and everyone else isn't paying attention, we shouldn't let it pass. So you can see this orange line uh, where the x-axis is the percent turnout uh, and the uh, y-axis is the, um, uh, the, the, the amount needed to pass. So for instance, here you can see if 10% uh, 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 turnout, then you need something like 72% I's to pass it. Uh, if only 1% turnout, then about 98% need to turn out, uh, need to vote I to pass it. Uh, however, as we get to 100% turnout, uh, that, that goes all the way down uh, to just a straight, what we call majority carries, 50% plus one. Something that is passed, in the, a proposal passed unanimously by the council is the inverse of that. Uh, the low, we, we assume if the council passes it unanimously, it's generally a good thing. We should err on the side of passing it. So you can see here at 10%, only about uh, turnout, only about 22% would have to vote I. If the council passes it, but not unanimously, it becomes that red dotted line a straight majority carries. The other wrinkle to voting is time lock voting. Uh, so here you can actually lock your tokens, you won't be able to transfer them, uh, in order to give your vote extra weight. So you can see here uh, we have, you know, if you don't want it to lock up at all, your votes are worth 0.1 times your tokens. 
Uh, so if I had 100 tokens, then, uh, and I voted without a lockup period, it'd only be worth 10. Whereas if I were willing to hold for 448 days, then I would be able to do 500 worth, five times. So you can see every extra multiple requires a doubling of the length of time locked. Uh, finally, there's the technical committee, which is a representative from each team that has built a Polkadot host or Polkadot runtime. And uh, the only power the technical committee has is the fast track referendums, uh, referenda. So all this means is that, hey, the technical committee has decided this is something that really needs to be done quickly. And so it can be voted on and executed quickly and put up for an immediate vote. It doesn't have to go through the, uh, uh, the, the, queue, the, uh, the, the proposal queue. So what does this all mean? Well, the fact that Polkadot has this on-chain governance and automatic enactment, this makes sure that the will of the stakeholders dominates. And there are checks and balances uh, along the way in terms of the, the, the council uh, and uh, the technical committee. Uh, and minimal power are granted to, to any one individual entity. Uh, Polkadot, remember, is a united network of these sovereign systems. So governance impacts the relay chain, but it cannot directly impact the parachain. So people can still decide to have their own governance. They could even decide to have you know, a total proof of authority system uh, that has uh, only certain people in charge and uh, doesn't matter what the, the stakeholders of, of that feel, as long as they basically in, in technical terms sort of explain that to the system ahead of time, they can follow it. This is just you know, for the relay chain and allows the relay chain uh, to progress. We provide a variety of ways to affect change, as well as you know, a totally transparent, totally open voting system that really works to prevent individual holders from wielding too much power while making sure that individuals can make their voice heard and ensure, you know, be assured themselves that those decisions will actually be binding on the chain. So uh, this is uh, uh, what I have. Uh, unfortunately, I will not be able to attend uh, the, the, uh, the Q&A session later. However, I will leave my email in the chat. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to email me. So thank you very much. Thank you, Bill, indeed, to you. Thanks also for leaving your coordinates in the chat so that interested people can still put maybe more serious questions to you. Our next speaker now is Adrien Zera. He is the adoption manager at Nomadic Labs. Adrien is an automation and control engineer who graduated from the National Graduate School of Energy, Water and Environment in France and also from the Sao Paulo State University in Brazil. Adrien started his career in Latin America, where he was managing a subsidiary of the Accents Group in Brazil, and he later joined the Nomadic Labs uh, as an adoption manager to push the Tezos protocol within private and public institutions and in France. And uh, Adrien, he will talk about the self-modification characteristic of the Tezos uh, protocol coupled with on-chain governance mechanisms, which eliminates the dependence to hard, for, hard folks to implement innovation. And with this uh, presentation, actually, we will already transition from the first part of today, the blockchain governments, uh, uh, to the second part, blockchain in finance, as Adrien will also present in his presentation, a financial asset tokenization use case. Adrien joined us from Paris, so we have the second speaker from Paris today. And uh, please welcome Adrien. Adrien, the microphone and the camera is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, this uh, organizing such a, a good event. Um, I will share my screen with you and start uh, with the, the presentation. So, um, uh, my name is Adrien. I joined Nomadic Labs in uh, 2019. And uh, as uh, just said, uh, I am in charge of the uh, adoption of the Tezos protocol in France. And uh, during this presentation, we will go through um, a, a, a quick presentation of the Tezos protocol, uh, its uh, on-chain governance mechanism, as well as uh, to conclude this presentation, we will go through uh, some use cases within the, the financial industry. So Tezos is a public blockchain, just uh, like Bitcoin, for instance. And it has 
some very nice characteristics. The first one is that it is a proof of stake based consensus algorithm blockchain, which has also uh, a very and a, a beautiful uh, uh, characteristic uh, to my mind, the, the most beautiful one, uh, it's on-chain governance system. Uh, so Tezos is a protocol, so it's a, it's a set of computing rules. And within this set of rules, you have some rules to modify the rules, which brings uh, to Tezos uh, an auto modification characteristic that we coupled with a voting system which takes place on the on chain on the uh, on the blockchain so the idea of having this uh, on chain governance mechanism is to eliminate the dependency to hard fork to have uh, a technical evolution of your protocol and this is really uh, important and interesting for corporate players or public institution when it comes to uh, deploying a project on the long term because those entities are generally looking or seeking for uh, stability. So Tezos uh, has this uh, on-chain uh, governance mechanism, which is already working, and that allows us to evolve swiftly uh, uh, and to bring technical evolution or technical innovation to, uh, to our technology. Finally, the last uh, uh, characteristic, the, the main last characteristic is the fact that on Tezos, you can formally prove every smart contract that you, you write, uh, which means that you can verify that the code of your smart contract is respecting the set of specification of your project. And this brings a high level of security uh, when it comes to eliminate, eliminate the, the risk of bugs in your smart contract. So, uh, here we have, for instance, all the hard forks that occurred on uh, Bitcoin. And um, uh, let me be frank here, the idea is not to criticize uh, Bitcoin or any other uh, public uh, blockchain. The idea is to say uh, that we can bring an alternative to the evolution of a public protocol or a public blockchain through hard forks. So if you are a central bank or a commercial bank and then you want to deploy a smart contract, node, issue some security tokens, you want to minimize the risks of hard forks uh, because you don't want to migrate on a new blockchain after hard fork. And uh, on Tezos, thanks to this self-modification characteristic and voting system, uh, which takes place on chain, you minimize a lot the risk of hard forks and you can evolve and bring technical evolution to your, to your protocol. So the idea is not to criticize, the idea is to say, if you want something else, we have an alternative. So how it works? Uh, every three months, we have uh, four periods. So the first one is the proposal period where any team in the world can propose a modification to the protocol, an amendment. And uh, after this period, we will enter the exploration vote period where we, if we meet uh, a quorum with a super majority, which is around 80% today, then we will enter into the testing period, okay? So every stakeholder of the Tezos blockchain will be able to participate to this vote that will take place on chain. And if we reach, as I said, uh, the quorum and the supermajority, then we will enter the testing period where the team which is behind the proposal or the amendment, uh, the propos amendment proposal will test during around three weeks the amended protocol on, on the testnet. And at the end of this testing period, we'll issue a report to show that there was no bug or there was a problem and to let the community, the stakeholders, vote again during the promotion vote period, which uh, uh, during which we will need as well to reach a quorum and a supermajority. And if we reach this quorum and this supermajority, and this is uh, where I would like you to feel the beauty of uh, the Tezos technology, every node of the protocol will update automatically and in a simultaneous way. And this is how we go from the former version of the protocol to the amended protocol. So we manage to have innovation, technical evolution of a decentralized protocol without a fork. And uh, this is not something which is only theoretical. We already did it three times. So the first amendment was ATEN. It made it was in May last year, where on Tezos, you have bakers, uh, which are the block producers, 
it's the equivalent of the miners on Bitcoin. And to be a baker, you needed to have at stake uh, 10,000 XTZ, which is the utility token of Tezos, before the uh, Aten amendments. And uh, the amendment proposal was to reduce this uh, quantity to 8,000 XTZ. And the idea behind this amendment was to test the on-chain mechanism uh, 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 governance, uh, uh, the on-chain governance mechanism, sorry, because we just had to modify one constant in the protocol. Instead of having 10,000 in the protocol, we wrote 8,000. But it was a very nice way to test for the first time that our on-chain governance mechanism was uh, working. The second amendment was Babylon last year in October, where we modified the consensus algorithm mechanism. Um, uh, and um, uh, this was a heavy amendment. And we managed to uh, modify the consensus algorithm of Tezos and to update our protocol without our fork. Finally, Carthage uh, in, May, in March this year, it's an amendment where we modify the way the protocol uh, remunerates because you have uh, 80 XTZ created uh, every block on Tezos. And uh, the, 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 so we modify the way the protocol was remunerating the bakers and the bakers that are uh, endorsing the transaction into the blocks. Uh, so as I said, it's not only a beautiful technology, uh, a theory call, uh, 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 nice technology. It's uh, already used and we are going to see in the next slide that it is used by corporates, uh, companies, and it's working. Uh, it's already the, we already done three amendments and now we are doing a fourth one that will terminate in three days. So we will amend the, the Tezos blockchain for the fourth time uh, in the, if I remember well, in the next three days. Okay, so uh, I was talking about on-chain governance and uh, I would like to highlight this uh, nice example of uh, Exion, which is a, a subsidiary of the, the EDF uh, French company. Uh, EDF is an, a leading company, a French company, but uh, a global company. Uh, if I remember well, they, their turnover is about 70 billion euro in 2019. So it's a huge company uh, owned by, uh, in part, partly owned by the French government. And uh, they became a baker on Tezos. So uh, we are very honored and happy to have uh, Exion participating to uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the uh, consensus algorithm on Tezos. But as well, Exion will participate to the on-chain governance mechanism because they will vote for uh, the evolution of the Tezos protocol. And we are talking about a corporate player, a huge uh, entity, which is participating to the on-chain governance mechanism of a public protocol. Another, uh, uh, and to make the, the transition with the, the, the financial application and tokenization of, of assets, uh, we've been selected by Société Générale as a protocol. So we will be one of the protocols used by Société Générale for the Banque de France Central Bank Digital Currency Experiments, uh, which shows that we managed to reach a certain level of maturity of our technology to be used by corporates and uh, and and uh, by uh, companies such as uh, Société Générale for uh, a very important project for uh, uh, the European uh, uh, system, uh, which is the Banque de France CBDC uh, project. Finally, and to conclude this pr presentation, um, one last example, which is a, an example of a tokenization of financial assets. We are being used today, and the project is already live, uh, by uh, a Brazilian bank called BTG Pactual, where they used uh, the Tezos public blockchain to issue security tokens representing bonds. Okay, so it's a portfolio of bonds that has been uh, emitted through a system of smart contracts and are represented today under the form of a security token on the Tezos public blockchain. So that's it. Um, if you have any question, uh, please feel free to contact uh, Thibaut, my colleague Thibaut, or myself uh, to those emails. Uh, and uh, I will be happy to, uh, to answer your question. And uh, I hope you enjoy your, this presentation. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present uh, to you all the Tezos protocol. Thank you very much.
So we continue now with building bridges and uh, actually we now look how to bridge DeFi and the real world by using token models to minimize trust in real world assets uh, by DeFi. And our next speaker is Cassidy Daly. She's token design and crypto economic uh, researcher at Centrifuge, or she does research at Centrifuge. Cassidy, she brings a strong foundation in economics to her current work on token economy design and engineering at Centrifuge. And she holds a master's in international finance from Columbia University, where she also worked as a consultant for the Federal Reserve. And Cassidy, she has one passion. Well, maybe she has other passions, but we know that she has a passion for token design and um, uh, comes uh, and and this passion comes from its potential to reimagine what an economy should look like from the ground up to better facilitate our needs as a global society. Cassidy, she joined us from Berlin. So Cassidy, please, the microphone and the camera is yours now. Thank you, Tom, for that introduction. Great. Um, so yes, as, uh, as Tom said, uh, I'm Cassidy and I work on token design and crypto economic research at Centrifuge where we are building a decentralized asset financing protocol. Uh, today I'm going to talk about our most recent work on an underwriter token. Um, this is a model to minimize trust in real world assets for DeFi uh, so that we can better bridge DeFi and the real world. Um, so I'm just going to start off with a quick overview of, of what is Centrifuge. So at a high level, it's a peer-to-peer -peer network for businesses. Uh, the first use case that we're building for is to finance real world, uh, meaning off-chain assets. Um, so those that are looking for asset financing, that's what we, what we call asset originators in our system. Um, they get access to cheaper and faster sources of capital. And then um, on the other side of this uh, are investors and they get better data and easier origin origination. Um, and hopefully with this model, uh, also better underwriting. Um, so Tinlink is our DAP that we've built as a part of the system that allows uh, both these asset originators and these investors to access and securitize funding. So Centrifuge provides the tools, uh, the foundation to minimize trust in assets. So the um, real founding layer is our off-chain protocol for private sharing of documents. Um, we also have what we call anchors on Centrifuge chain, which is built on substrate. Um, that provides immutabil immutability and verifiability for these documents. And then NFTs are the tokens that can represent documents on chain, which makes them transferable, makes the assets transferable. And then, as I mentioned, this Tinlake DAP uh, allows these assets to be pooled together to create a new and fungible asset class that can now access the DeFi ecosystem for liquidity. So the next challenge and what I really want to focus on today is uh, risk and asset valuation. So DeFi requires even more trust minimization um, than we have today. Assets need to be reliably, reliably valued um, and the risk and liquidation process of these assets also needs to be clear. Um, so currently those assets uh, these actions are centralized in what we call the asset originator in our system. So decentralizing these actions, we think, will result in efficiency, quality, and most importantly, reduced risk to the system. So asset originators and investors have opposing interests. The asset originators are looking for a lower cost for their capital, um, investors are looking to optimize for their risk and return. Uh, so underwriters are incentivized to find the right price for the assets in the system and provide liquidity and risk management as well. Um, so today underwriters are the single most centralized entity in the world to decide on credit. And banks only do this if there's enough of an incentive um, and this leaves many unserved businesses. 
Um, also unchecked, underwriters have no incentive to, to not screw up. Um, so we want to ask the question, what if underwriter, the underwriter was also decentralized, uh, meaning trust minimized? Uh, so the next step is to decentralize risk and asset valuation. Um, so centrifuges decentralized underwriters, we think, will enable real businesses to borrow money faster and cheaper without relying on a bank. So now that we've opened up access to asset financing for both asset originators and investors, our next step is to decentralize this risk and asset valuation by incentivizing a distributed group of underwriters. So the underwriter's expertise in the system is the valuation of the assets and the assessment of their risk. Um, they are responsible for deciding which assets to finance and at what price they should be financed. Um, so our proposed token mechanism aims to facilitate this trustlessness, the valuation of assets, and the risk assessment for each of our Tin Lake pools. So the objectives of this design are to remove a single point of failure. Um, and we do this by providing the ability for underwriters to compete, to do the best job. Um, also an incentivization to actually value these assets. Um, distributed and broader risk assessment, we think will provide more accuracy um, and providing a doorkeeper to access to the assets that are entering this pool should also um, necessitate that this doorkeeper is taking the first loss as well. So we use uh, what we call the TIN token in the system um, to give the holder the power to decide which assets are financed by this pool, determine their price and risk, and then for this service, earn fees. Um, as the underwriter in the system. So a high level look um, at what this token model looks like. Um, so the first step is that an asset originator would propose the asset to be financed with a minimum stake of this TIN token. Um, underwriters would then stake TIN tokens on assets that they would like to be financed. Assets that are above the minimum threshold of, a, of an amount of tin that is staked, and then with the largest stake that are behind them, are then financed by the pool according to the risk class um, that is proposed. So essentially, underwriters are deciding under which terms assets are to be financed within the boundaries that are set by the pool itself. Then, as the loan is repaid, this increases the value of the tin token. Um, so tin token holders are earning this value. And then as well, new tin is also minted to underwriters that are staked towards these assets. If there is a loss of the loan, it's recovered by burning staked tin. And if the loss exceeds the amount that's staked, then all of the tin token holders are taking a hit. Um, so our design goals for this asset underwriting uh, is that if no loans are qualifying, bad loans should not get financed. Um, there should also be a minimum threshold of tin that's at stake relative to the amount of the loan. And if there are more assets that qualify than the liquidity to finance them, only those with the largest stake, so the best assets, um, are getting financed uh, in that time period. And we also wanted to provide incentives for active participation. So this is why uh, each time period we're minting new tin token holder, new tin tokens to those that are staked. Um, and it's only distributed to those that are actually participating in this asset curation. Um, but participating in a way that's actually helpful for the pool, meaning only those that are staked towards assets that actually get repaid. Um, so essentially, not participating in this will lead to the dilution of a tin holder stake. So we foresee that um, someone may build delegation models on top of this model as well to allow tin investors to actually delegate their tokens to underwriters for better asset curation. Um, and underwriters can earn yield in these tin tokens for providing this service. 
So by opening up access to participation for underwriters in the system, we think the result will be greater access to financing for borrowers. This mechanism will also facilitate the decentralization of underwriters, increasing participation in valuation and risk assessment, and therefore reducing the overall risk of the system. Um, funding sources will find more transparency as a result uh, with clear definitions of the value of assets and the estimated risk vetted by several parties. Um, I know that was a lot to digest. Um, thank you all for your time today. And you probably have questions. Feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, I'll also stick around. And if you want to learn more, we're also hosting a community call this Thursday. And I'll share a link to that in the chat as well. Thank you, Cassidy. Thank you very much. OK, we come to, to our next um, topic now to our next speaker. Um, and this is about compliance. Uh, so actually, when we talk about crypto and economy and traditional financial markets, so that's one of the major issues. And we have one person now tonight with us who knows a lot about this. Uh, and this is Pierre Girard. He's the CEO of uh, Scorechain. Pierre started his uh, interest in Bitcoin and uh, also blockchain in 2014. And shortly after, in 2015, he created one of the first mobile uh, Bitcoin wallets for iOS. And then just shortly after, he co-founded Scorechain and became CEO. Uh, and that was in 2015. And besides, Pierre was also one of the leaders of the FunChain project here in Luxembourg. And before, actually in 2000, he started his entrepreneurial career and was one of the co-founders of Jamendo, which is a completely different business because it's the biggest music platform under creative common license. Pierre holds a master's degree in computer science and he joins us also from Paris. So again, a speaker from Paris is very heavily represented tonight. So Pierre, welcome to Luxembourg and the camera and the mic is yours. Okay, thank you. Let me start the presentation. So technically I'm not in Paris because of the new lockdown in France. So I'm somewhere in France, okay, but I, I managed to connect. Uh, today with you, I'm very happy for that. Um, so uh, I'm Pierre Jarre. thank you Tom for the introduction. Uh, yeah. Scorchen is a blockchain analytics platform. Today we, our solutions are mainly used for um, crypto AML and I will give you uh, more information in, uh, in the presentation. Um, don't forget that the game, so maybe two answers uh, uh, to the contest will be hidden in my presentation. So uh, uh, yeah. We have to follow this. So, um, well, first of all, we need to talk about um, a crypto market. If you want to discuss how traditional finance uh, can enter in this market and uh, uh, how, how they can comply uh, with uh, this new regulation, so we have to understand. Uh, they have to understand the, the crypto market. What, what are uh, the new crypto assets, what are who are the um, the players, and what are the different usages that we can we we have. So you know that um, today there's a lot of uh, uh, crypto assets worldwide and uh, uh, maybe thousands of uh, assets, tokens, and uh, uh, other type of virtual assets. But don't forget that uh, Bitcoin represents like um, 60, 65, maybe two thirds of the global market uh, capitalization of the crypto assets today is from Bitcoin. So the um, snapshot, the screenshot I took on November 4th is um, on coin market cap, there was a global market capitalization of 400 billion of dollars. I think it was for maybe 10% more today, but anyway, it's a, it's, it's a huge amount of, uh, of money that is today uh, in the crypto, uh, crypto assets. Who are the players? So, okay, we have the, these new assets. Who are the players? How, how can I deal with that? And obviously, the first um, contact that you can you have with crypto assets are um, cryptocurrency exchanges. And um, you know we have a, a top seven here. Uh, Binance is you know the, the daily volume of uh, around ten billions of um, dollars every day. Uh, and also other other platform uh, dealing with more billions of uh, dollars every day. Uh, what is important to notice here is uh, some players have been have been in the 
in the game for almost 10 years in you know, a Kraken, beat stamp. Uh, they're going to celebrate their 10th anniversary next year. So um, they had to, to adapt, you know, to um, to a lot of um, a new new rules, uh, requirements, uh, a lot of challenges they have to uh, uh, to the face during this uh, this first ten years. And uh, now we have new players, um, decentralized uh, exchange. Uh, we know that it's, um, there's no more central platform. There are no order books. It's a liquidity pool, and uh, it's um, based based on the smart contract. It's a, it's a new business and it's really related to uh, and you, some um, presentations talk, um, told about uh, DeFi, but uh, decentralized exchanges are uh, the, the first players in this uh, DeFi uh, ecosystem. Um, so this is where the financial innovation is today. So uh, Adrian talked about decentralized finance and we just talked about tokenization. Um, so we have um, um, a, a good example of um, how uh, financial contracts, loan derivative, in, in investment, they can get they can really get rid of um, third parties. Now we can sign a contract in the blockchain, and uh, we can uh, the blockchain really let's say uh, guarantee the execution of this uh, of this contract, but. This is pure blockchain um, implementation. And this is why it's really important that you have like new project like uh, CBDC. It's a, it will be a link uh, between this new type of assets and the uh, traditional uh, uh, fiat currencies. And if then with the CBDC, we are able to uh, implement um, Euro, dollar, in a blockchain, and it will facilitate the interaction with uh, other type of uh, new type of assets. It is the same with tokenization. If you are able to tokenize um, a building or the shares of a, of a company, so again, it's all part. All this innovation is a different. Um, it's like um, um, uh, different pieces that need to be uh, put together, and uh, we can talk also about a bl um, blockchain payment, liquidity provider, because. All of this will facilitate the access um, to the ecosystem for, for the new, new new customers. It could be new customer, I mean, could be a private people, private person, or it could be obviously a corporation. And today you can focus, you can also have a look at if you want to enter the game, what what are the services that are, are used today? Uh, we talk about uh, exchanges for sure. Uh, this is a way that uh, anyone can uh, um, Interact with um, a crypto uh, currency or crypto crypto assets. We have OTC trading desk. It's more like if you have a, if you are a corporation, if you need to sell, or if you want to sell one thousand bitcoins, maybe you won't go on the on Kraken. You will uh, uh, maybe contact a, 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 an OTC desk and uh, find the best deal for you. Um, other players are wallet providers. In, in, wallet providers for me is more like um, used by. Um, uh, like retail, uh, so uh, you have access on your on your laptop with a software. You have access on the, with the hardware solution like uh, like Ledger, for instance, in other or example, other other type of other providers. And you have custodian. Custodian is more like for institution. If you want to secure and uh, you know um, uh, big, uh, big, uh, huge bigger huge amount of uh, of coins of uh, of tokens, and a bank, for instance, or an exchange. Uh, they will use um, custody solution. That they can, we can implement different processes. We can control uh, who can sign and what are the rules to sign um, uh, a, a, a transaction. And also the custodian will guarantee, will provide a lot of security. And um, uh, other players, uh, we can we have BitPay for instance, but your payment platform again is a way how we can what are how can I use my my coins? How can I pay for something? And um, digital asset issuers, we, if we talk about uh, security token offering, a tokenization, ICO, we have also these uh, players that are um, issuing uh, digital asset that can be used later for for payment or for uh, any, any type of um, of transaction. So what is the um, why there is an opportunity. Uh, okay, we have um, these pure players, but if I am a, a traditional institution, 
uh, why should I go there? Why should I, go, why should I be interested in the crypto uh, uh, crypto crypto world? First of all, because it's happening, and um, you know, you heard a few um, few weeks ago, uh, PayPal um, uh, announced that they are uh, they will integrate um, Bitcoin in their um, in the platform, so we'll be able to to pay or to buy, and to buy Bitcoin on on PayPal. Uh, it give access to more than three million of uh, customers. Um, we have also, uh, I say, it's a huge step um, for uh, like uh, some kind of a democratization of um, of uh, of Bitcoin of any and uh, in the future of any type, any new uh, new assets. And I can also take the example, but Adrian <laughs> uh, talk talk about it uh, just before. Um, there's a huge project with Société Générale. They have issued a, a bond in, the, um, in Ethereum, and uh, with uh, uh, the, the pilot project done by uh, led by uh, Banque de France, it's a way uh, how we can integrate uh, traditional uh, instruments in with this new technology. And it's not only in Europe; it's not only in Paris. It's, all, it's also in other a lot of countries. And I just took the example of uh, Hong Kong. Uh, that is also going to uh, uh, to uh, to develop a, a, a CBDC. Uh, but you no, know, <laughs> during uh, uh, some some screenshots that were like five years old. But um, we uh, there's always some kind of fear. You know, some uh, some banks, some uh, uh, maybe financial institutions, some uh, family offices that don't want to invest, that don't want to deal with uh, with crypto uh, crypto assets because uh, okay, Bitcoin is bad. It's linked with darknet. We have ransomware. Uh, we have scam. But in fact, there are, we, we, you don't need Bitcoin for that. You can do this. <laughs> you can. Uh, you, bad guys are using uh, any type of uh, of channels of assets if they can do do some uh, some bad business, but. Um, um, now we people understand that illegal activities in crypto are a tiny part of global illegal activities. Be you remember that uh, uh, two two months ago we have this new report and uh, and banks and have laundered more, more than two two thousand billions of dollars during the, the last decade. So um, um, it's not about only uh, the money laundering is a problem, but we, and we we don't uh, really care what is um, what is uh, assets used for that. But um, we need to be um, uh, yeah, to 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 take care of this. And maybe you you saw that uh, two two or three days ago, uh, FBI have, have seized one billion of um, dollars uh, coming from uh, the Silk Road uh, the Silk Road hack. But uh, it's like like it was seven years ago. It was a wallet that has been uh, identified seven years ago. There were at this time fourteen million, and now the FBI gets one billion. So it's a good it's a good deal for them, um, because regulation is coming. In fact, and this is why we have less and less, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, um, problems. Or we we focus now on the innovation and not on. Uh, all the bad stuff that can happen around crypto assets. So we have this a ML device anti-money laundering directive, uh, fifth, fifth one in uh, in Europe, and I've been uh, implemented in the different countries uh, since the beginning of the year. Um, so basically, it will um, describe um, what are the what are the checks that we need to do you need to do. Yes, if you operate, uh, if you uh, if you operate with um, with crypto assets, and um, in France we have the uh, part of this uh, uh, transposition of the directive is in the visa in France. We have eight uh, players, uh, uh, so vast virtual asset service provider um, and ICOs are, are already registered. I'm quite happy because um, six of them are core chain customers, and so we help them to fulfill with. Um, this uh, to fulfill this visa. Um, Finma, which is a Swiss uh, regulator, they have issued licenses to pure uh, player, um, the crypto services for Signum and Seba Bank. Uh, in Bafin, it's Germany. Uh, crypto custodians are now regulated, and banks can provide crypto custody solution to their customer. And in, in Luxembourg, uh, CSSF has defined a uh, a registration for for VASP if they want to operate under the Luxembourgish law. Uh, 
uh, and the global, and, uh, it's a global approach with the FATF, the GAFI in French. Uh, they have different risk indicators uh, for um, for crypto assets. Well, what kind of um, indicators need to implement and to check? And there is also this work in progress for implementation of the travel rule. The travel rule is uh, our banks today are exchanging information about uh, in, in the deal who send the money, who get the money, and um, so the FATF tried to implement the same kind of rules for um, crypto uh, players, but it's not so easy because. It, by definition, the, the implementation of a blockchain transaction is, is different. So it's uh, still a, a discussion uh, that is happening and our, uh, to find the best way to implement and to be uh, transparent between uh, um, between exchanges, for instance. And we have this new um, uh, MICA, so um, proposal for uh, market and crypto asset regulation uh, that, that is currently discussed by the different association and uh, uh, and players who can give the feedback. Um, the only issue today is that I'm not talking at all about Bitcoin. Bitcoin is not in the proposal. It's funny to notice, to notice that, but also um, we, it's a way, but it will be a way to, for uh, the, uh, the banks today uh, to enter in this market because uh, it will be maybe easier for them. So um, the first remark that we can get uh, uh, concerning this uh, proposal is uh, how uh, the um, how the innovation can be um, can be encouraged and, and not to be uh, to be stopped or to be uh, to, to be slowed down because uh, maybe for some startup it could be very difficult uh, to follow this regulation. Anyway, at the end of the day, it's always the same. It's uh, IML and CFT, so uh, counterterrorism. Um, uh, process. Uh, we we have to uh, identify uh, where the funds are coming from, where they're going to, what is the uh, activity of my customers, if I can detect any risk. So, but so today we, the banks are doing this every day, and um, so it's just uh, they have to adapt if they are dealing with uh, uh, crypto assets and to implement new kind of uh, processes because. In fact, in blockchain, you know, the blockchain is a pseudo anonymity, but the blockchain is immutable, immutable and public. So you can always find a transaction back, uh, back in the past five years ago. And this is, we took the example of the, of the seizure from the FBI uh, concerning wallets, uh, seven, seven years old wallet. And so finally, at the end, we can ask a question it's more transparent than financial system because we, um, by definition, the blockchain uh, doesn't change. So if I want to identify the origin of funds, uh, in what, what are the use cases? If, um, if I'm a, a bank and I need to onboard a new uh, a, a private or a corporate customer, um, if, um, uh, because the, the, they, came, they are coming with a, with a lot of money from a, from a cash out or because they received um, uh, money from a trade, stuff like that. So, uh, onboarding is uh, for the use case, monitoring customer activity. Okay, when I've, I've onboarded this customer, now I can manage his, his uh, uh, assets. So I have to check maybe my, the activity on my own, the world because I, I'm providing um, some kind of guarantee to him. So I have to, to follow what is uh, happening. <laughs> and uh, if no one is uh, uh, trying to, to steal this, um, this, uh, this asset. Um, Original funds need to be identified also for ICO, obviously, and we, when you receive token, because we not, it's not only about monitoring uh, Bitcoin, but also you know, AML on cryptocurrency, but also AML on the, any type of uh, assets like like token tokens. And uh, if you enter in, in a relation, business relationship with a third party, um, okay, in case of trading or investment, obviously again you have to check uh, the origin of funds. And uh, so process, the process is a little bit different. We separate in two types, the off-chain, which is as usual, we do KYC, you, if the, uh, the person is on a, a PEP list, a world checklist, stuff like that, you have to uh, check uh, if, you, if you are um, receiving money from uh, trading activities, uh, you have to um, see the, uh, all the uh, history of the different terms uh, of these uh, trading activities. Uh, if you if there's some cash in cash out uh, to the customer need to bring the proof of the different bank transfers he did, 
uh, also that he is um, able to sign uh, the wallet because he, to, to prove the ownership of the of the wallet and maybe to provide tax report invoices if we, if we are talking about mining you know mining means that you tell hardware and uh, electricity so how um, are you paid for that so this is the option it is not some, something that scorchen is uh, providing today but it's like uh, compliance officer in in banks are, are, are quite easy for them to 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 check this. What we are providing at Scorchain is we are able to verify on chain transactions. So verify transaction in the blockchain in real time, identify clusters. It means from one address to identify the other addresses used by a customer. Uh, we have implemented a risk scoring, risk indicators, so real time monitoring. We can also store information, generate report, and um, so this is how we have to, to today to um, uh, compliance officer have to uh, monitor activity. So off chain, we are very similar to what they're doing every day, and on chain, and this is a, a, a new type of of compliance and of uh, of uh, check that need, need to be done. So to uh, the tools for quickly uh, score chain, we have we are eighty customers in twenty nine countries. Main, uh, and working with banks and the crypto players, monitoring seven blockchains, and this is, we, are, we have a few examples of what we what we provide. So uh, UI is very you know, able to identify origin of uh, of yeah, take the example of Bitcoin, the origin of uh, incoming Bitcoin, whether uh, Bitcoins are going to outgoing report, uh, able also to uh, generate. Uh, this kind of uh, know your transaction report that they are, are very useful uh, for the regulators. So it's a um, solution uh, implementing all the uh, the new rules, crypto AML rules, and accessible via the UI API and reports. And we have just published a few a few months ago this new uh, implementer risk based approach guide um, uh, when we describe how the FETF. A rec um, recommendation that should be implemented in a product like Scorchain. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Paris. So very interesting. I think we just learned that uh, the French regulator AMF uh, has already eight crypto services uh, registered. Uh, so this might be an information that might be useful. Who knows? So eight crypto services uh, registered at the French regulator AMF. We talk again about uh, compliance and we build another bridge and this time with tomorrow's topic, which is supply chain and logistic. And we welcome now uh, Christopher Fernandez, who will present how to enhance contract compliance in supply chains using DLT. The solution that is presented is currently being integrated into one of the largest procurement companies in the world, so you will discover during this presentation which company it is. Incidentally, there is a link with Luxembourg, and I also use this opportunity to welcome actually Blockgemini here in Luxembourg, since uh, their arrival was announced no later than today. Our speaker now, I mentioned already, is Chris Fernandez. He's the founder and CEO of Blockgemini. Chris founded Blockgemini in 2017 and has since grown into one of the leading enterprise blockchain solutions companies in the Middle East, North Africa region with over 150 employees. And as the CEO of Block Gemini, Chris takes an active role in guiding innovation and strategy within the organization. And besides that, actually, Chris is also a successful entrepreneur and a true virtuoso in network engineering. Chris joins us from Dubai today. And Chris, the um, camera and the mic is yours now. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Uh, it is a pleasure to be invited to speak here at the InfraChain Summit. My name is Christopher Fernandez and I'm the CEO of Blockgemini. A little bit about the company. Blockgemini is a software solutions agency based, based out of Dubai. And uh, we focus on building enterprise digital transformation solutions using emerging technologies like AI, blockchain, and IoT. Um, in the past few years, we've had the privilege of working on multiple enterprise blockchain initiatives. And uh, one of the most exciting projects was the one we did with the Vodafone procurement company. Uh, so in this presentation, I will be taking you through how a blockchain was used as a means to solve some of the limitations in their contracting processes. Now, before I get into the use case itself, 
I just want to talk a little bit about the value block of, of blockchain. When we look at large enterprises today, they have a series of cloud-based applications, legacy ERP systems, uh, business intelligence tools, uh, IoT devices, and so on to manage their day-to-day uh, -day operations. All of this transactional data is recorded centrally in their own database. And normally this data is not shared with any other organization that they do business with. But blockchain helps bridge the gap by creating a layer of trust that is secure, tamper-proof, and leaves an immutable audit, audit trail for organizations communicating with the ledger. By doing so, it offers us the ability to fundamentally change our current infrastructure and shift the element of trust from humans to a trustless automated system. Now, there may be a lot of hype around blockchain, <laughs> uh, but I truly believe that when it comes to global supply chains, blockchain will be the fundament fundamental uh, infrastructure on top of which next generation business applications will be built. And this has profound implications on the way we do business today. The way we manage contracts today is a perfect opportunity to showcase the true value of blockchain technology. When you look at the contract management lifecycle, it is no doubt a resource uh, intensive process. And it uh, involves many steps, requires multiple revisions, and you need to have constant visibility on the contracted term. The larger the organization, the more complex the process and the higher the risk and financial impact if managed uh, ineffectively. As you can see from some of the stats highlighted here, large organizations on average deal with around 40,000 active contracts at any given time. Uh, when you consider the volume of transactions, the potential for error, disputes, fraud, or mismanagement is significant. According to the Global Contract Management Association, companies lose almost a tenth of their bottom line due to the mismanagement of contracts. So this is definitely a problem worth fixing. The first problem that blockchain solves is in terms of visibility on these contracts. By maintaining a shared ledger or a single source of truth for the contracts, you can drastically reduce the likelihood of having disputes with your business partners. The nature of, of blockchain is such that every single change made to an agreement is timestamped, uh, logged, and tamper-proof. So you basically know who made what change and at what time. Using smart contracts, you would be able to automate the execution of contractual terms like periodic price changes, service penalties, uh, contract renewals, and more. And uh, finally, since you have all this data stored on a, on a shared ledger, all the reports and analytics that you or your business partners generate will be based on accurate, mutually agreed tamper-proof data. So at Blockgemini, we use the experience gained from working with our supply chain clients and got together with our in-house counsel and some other legal experts to come up with a contract management solution. We analyzed traditional methods used while authoring, negotiating, signing, and monitoring contracts and looked at how we could improve some of these processes. One of the main things we noticed was that the collaborative aspect of authoring and negotiating contractual documents was being done offline. Most organizations continue to use Word and Excel documents and then share these via email. So it was quite a disconnected process. So the first step was allowing contracting parties to collaborate on a shared digital interface across the contract, contract management lifecycle. Once we could establish the network for these organizations to work together on the same documents at the same time, then it was just a matter of looking at what additional features could be added on top to improve automation capabilities. So, for example, if you have a clause in place with a supplier stating that once a certain volume of items was purchased from them, the price for that item would be discounted by a certain amount, uh, then the system will automatically trigger this price change and have this updated in the relevant systems accordingly. You could even configure KPI clauses to interact with IoT systems. Uh, like for example, if you were transporting sensitive medicines and they had to be transported at a certain temperature, and if those conditions are not met, uh, then the readings from the IoT devices trigger the generation of a service penalty based on how you have configured the clause. And all this could be done automatically without the need for any human intervention. So sort of like uh, add the rule, uh, negotiate the terms, agree the change, and then just simply forget about it. You can be rest assured that the system will automatically execute the rule at the right time. Now, 
uh, I would like to point out that these sorts of complex triggers require a certain level of customization and integration with ERP systems. But it's important to understand that these sorts of capabilities are not far-fetched. It's these functions that really add to the savings and operational efficiencies that can be achieved with blockchain. So we designed the solution using a microservices architecture. This allows us to be a plug-in, allows us to be able to plug into any supply chain ecosystem. And the solution can be customized to meet any procurement process flow. When it comes to the deployment, the solution is agnostic. Uh, so you could choose to run this on Hyperledger Fabric or Corda or even Core for that matter. Now, coming to the specific use case with Vodafone. The project is one we have been working on for almost two years now. It has evolved from a proof of concept to an MVP and is soon to be launched as a pilot across several local markets and suppliers. The problem put forward was that the process of managing procurement contracts was resource intensive and had a high potential for human error. Vodafone Procurement Company, also known as VPC, deals with, half, with over half a million items offered by thousands of suppliers across multiple local markets. This translates to about 50,000 contracts that need to be managed annually. And uh, with the current resources, they could only manage about a thousand of them. What this resulted in was low visibility on their contracts. And this, uh, as you must know, leads to uh, partner disputes, uh, tedious and costly sessions for cross-verifying transactions, and millions in value leakage annually. So VPC needed a solution that could help them scale their current operations and also ensure better contractual compliance with their partners. Since we were dealing with sensitive information, the solution had to ensure that the data could not be manipulated by any one party. Using blockchain became the obvious choice. Since a traditional database approach would not achieve the level of trust that would be required to successfully implement a solution like this, Number one. Uh, number two, uh, we could establish uh, network governance rules using smart contracts. And this allowed us to automatically trigger workflows, price updates, discount applications, report generations, and so on. Finally, by integrating with their internal order processing systems, we were able to proactively prevent errors in transactions and uh, produce reports that highlighted any transactional discrepancies. The results we managed to achieve were exceptional, as you can see on the far right of the slide. The solution allowed greater cross-party visibility on contracted terms. Catalog management efficiency grew by almost 90%. Activation of agreed contract terms that previously took around six days was literally now executed instantly. And all of this resulted in an estimated 1% to 2% savings on, multi -million, on a multi-million euro procurement spend. This technology really does work, everyone. Um, and uh, all of this was actually achieved in our first phase of the solution, which is set to be expanded further into Vodafone's procurement operations. So uh, this diagram just gives you an overview of the solution design. On the left, you can see the current infrastructure used by Vodafone in their procurement. As you can see, the various stages use different sets of applications and tools. For the first release, we focused on the aspect of pricing negotiation and agreements, since this was the most dynamic part of the contracting process. As you can tell from the diagram, the price negotiation process was done using tools like Excels and emails. This was replaced by our collaboration tool. And this basically allowed both the suppliers and the managers at Vodafone to negotiate pricing and discount rules in real time on the same document. Any changes made by either party would become visible in real time, and this would automatically trigger approval workflows. Once both the users agree on the version of the document, the final items and their pricing information would automatically be pushed to their external ERP systems. This would ensure that the accurate pricing would be reflected in the external systems used for processing purchase orders. Previously, this process would be managed manually, and again, would take about four to six days on average. But now with the blockchain-based uh, collaboration tool in place, this would happen almost instantly with little to no human intervention. And then on the supplier side, they have access to the same data on the blockchain level. 
these suppliers can build on top of the collaboration tool and add efficiencies to their own processes. They even have the option to connect their internal systems to the ledger and generate reports based on this data. So as you can see from this diagram, the fact that both parties are able to agree the same terms at the same time, again, on a shared ledger, this data source acting as a single source of truth can significantly optimize contracting operations and almost completely eliminate disputes on pricing. Now, with regards to some of the challenges we faced, <laughs> uh, it's, it seems that no blockchain project is immune <laughs> to any sort of challenges, but here we go. Um, they're really down to the same roadblocks that any large enterprise would face with process re-engineering. Deploying a solution that impacts such a sensitive and critical part of the supply chain uh, requires a fair amount of commitment and investment from the organization. Making sure the solution fits in perfectly with the existing infrastructure requires collaboration between multiple departments of the organization. Organizations need to be ready to invest time and effort into making the solution a reality. This includes training and an induction period to allow time for stakeholders to become familiar with the system before it goes into production. Additionally, when we talk about blockchain, there is the challenge of getting your business partners to join your blockchain network. This is another area where organizations will need to invest time and effort in coordinating with their business partners. These users would then need to be trained to use the system and also be supported as required over the first couple of years of operation. Now, all of these essentially point to a relative, relatively high TCO. But that being said, when you look at the benefits to be gained, where from process efficiencies, minimization of disputes, uh, and most importantly, scaled operations, uh, these savings significantly outweigh the costs of deployment in the long run. By taking a blockchain-based approach, you would be taking the first steps towards truly transforming your business. And this is true for both you and your business partners. Once you are able to establish this network of trust with your partners, you will start finding more ways to collaborate and mutually increase profits. And uh, by having a shared data source, the possibilities for AI-based analytics, smart automation, and detailed business insights are far greater than you would be able to achieve with traditional databases. What we have learned over the past few years is that blockchain as a force for economic change is undoubted. More and more POCs are reaching maturity now and slowly coming into the mainstream. And uh, sorry, I just had to check the price of Bitcoin. Yes, it is on fire. I can't get my eyes, keep my eyes off of it. But uh, on that note, I would like to thank InfraChain once again for having us. Uh, I appreciate your efforts in organizing such events that uh, help us share our collective experience with each other and grow this community. Thank you very much. Thanks, to you, Thanks very much for your presentation and for joining from Dubai. So I know it's quite late already for you. And uh, so now we're also very close to the end of today's session of Infrachain Summit. Before we come to the wrap up, you see that Thomas is already ready to do it. So we have uh, one important uh, information. I think you all heard it. So actually the uh, blockchain framework that was used in the development of the contract management solution is Hyperledger Fabric. And so this is information you may find it useful again. So Hyperledger Fabric can be useful if you're actually participating in the quiz. I think you had all understood. It was very intense to program, very interesting. I think a lot of insights on governance and on blockchain in finance. Now we can relax a bit, grab a drink. Unfortunately, Thomas, you cannot relax now, but you will do now the wrap up for us. And if you have any questions, this is also now that they can be addressed. So Thomas, I give you the floor. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. So good evening, everybody. Hope you enjoyed this second quite packed uh, day dedicated to blockchain in governance and finance. It is now the usual wrap up time. And so if we look back a bit about what happened today. So we kicked off the, the day with a very interesting keynote from Consensus. Uh, discussing the key criteria of success when it comes to the governance of a blockchain consortium. Strong governance being considered as a key success factor and a prerequisite 
for sustainable blockchain-based consortium. So extremely important to keep in mind. I mean, it's like in any um, concrete and tangible traditional project, governance is key and nothing different uh, whenever we talk about the blockchain one. We then had a great presentation from the Web3 uh, Foundation, uh, providing an overview, a technical overview of the Polkadot governance framework, explaining an explanation, sorry, about some of the trade-offs, rationales, as well as details about the specific governance decision that have been already made. I found particularly interesting the, um, the discussion around the on-chain treasury function, about the tips, the proposal, and the bounties. It's really, uh, really, really interesting um, case of application. Great stuff. We then had uh, Nomadic Labs uh, discussing and introducing us to Tezos and its self-amending feature and on-chain governance mechanism as a hatch against hard fork, uh, and also presented a couple of interesting use cases, whether it is around on-chain governance, CBDC, and financial asset tokenization. Uh, so very, very interesting things, as obviously hard fork represents a risk today for business, uh, and the simple fact that we can somehow automate and, and manage this is bringing a peace of mind to uh, the technical evolution of, of those protocols. So interesting, interesting developments there as well. We, because it was a very packed day actually, this we are only, on, only at the, at the, um, at the um, sorry, uh, half of the, of the day there. And we then stepped in into the DeFi world with Centrifuge, whose uh, purpose is to bridge real world asset and DeFi. More concretely, we heard about the Centrifuge, how Centrifuge is somehow taking factoring at another level of efficiency, bringing somehow, I consider it as a kind of a decentralized working capital funding tokenizing uh, the underlying assets as an NFT and bringing liquidity to these uh, to these instruments. So very interesting. And actually, I'm curious to see how corporates would react to that as uh, factoring and capital, capital uh, working capital funding is a, is a great um, is a great topic of discussion in, the, in big groups. So very interesting there as well. We then uh, explore some of the key features of blockchain technology, namely transparency and immutability through score chain risk AML solution for KYT, so know your transaction in the crypto space, which allows uh, for the implementation of, a, of an AML uh, risk-based approach for any organization wishing to seize the opportunity of the crypto business, uh, but doing it in a compliant manner and a safe manner, sorry. So again, very interesting here. And last, but certainly not the least, we discussed how DLTs can manage contract compliance in the supply chain area with Blockgemini, contract management solution, sorry, which enables supply chain partners to agree contractual terms, negotiating pricing structures, and manage compliance report on a secure um, digital collaboration platform. That's it, Tom. Obviously a very rich content today uh, with great speakers and tangible solutions. So welcome, guys. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. Over to you. Thank you, Thomas, and he did. I think uh, maybe I can add also that we learned also that even off the internet, nobody knows your dog on Zoom. Exactly. Everybody does. Exactly, exactly. Question time. So it's uh, already late, but maybe you will have a few questions. So let's see. Please, uh, if you have some, you can put them in the chat. So we're looking in the chat, whether there are some Labs. I know that there was one question earlier for nomadic labs, but unfortunately, Adrien, as he had put in the chat, he had to leave for another call. Um, so maybe that will be for another time. So do you have any questions? Actually, again, I think our speakers, they were very clear. Yeah, obviously, obviously, but maybe people will have questions tomorrow or the day after. Yes, and they digest all of will, that. There will be questions via mail, probably, and via LinkedIn. <laughs> okay, well, I think then it's uh, the end of day two. Obviously. Thank you very much. Thank you to the audience for staying with us. Thank you also to the technical team here at PwC. Thank you to Thierry Grandjean, our technical lead who managed the call today. Thanks to our sponsors, PwC Luxembourg, NetService, Telendus, and Tomorrow Street. So I hope to see you again tomorrow. We will have another very interesting session. It will be focused on supply chain and logistics. 
with a special um, guest, I could say, the World Economic Forum. So we very much look forward to, to forward to welcoming them at our conference. And until then, stay safe. And so tune in again tomorrow at five o'clock. Thank you all. Bye-bye.